So what I'd like to do today is just uh, give kind of a general uh, overview of some of the disease problems we have in canola, focusing mainly on uh, two diseases that are probably the most common, uh, rhizoctonia and sclerotinia. But I also want to talk about a potentially new disease uh, we may have emerging in this area. Uh, it's referred to as black leg, also known as fomus stem rot. So in general, we really don't have a lot of disease problems uh, in the Pacific Northwest. And one of the main reasons for this is that canola is not extensively grown in this region, although we would like to see more of it grown here. Right now, there just isn't a lot grown, and so the pests are, are pretty low. Uh, a lot of the pathogens that impact uh, the brassicas are, are specific to brassicas. They aren't going to go to wheat or, or potatoes or other crops we grow. They're specific to these crops. So we don't have a source of inoculum in the area. In addition, we have, in general, have a, a dry summer climate. And so uh, there's, there's really little, very little summer rainfall, and this reduces uh, foliar diseases. Uh, a lot of these fungi that are causing foliar diseases rely on uh, free water on the leaf surface in order for uh, invasions to occur. However, if you're growing canola or other brassicas under irrigation, uh, that can simulate this, this summer rainfall, and you could potentially have some problems. So I mentioned we don't really have many pathogens in the area on other crops that could go jump over to our, our brassicas. But there's also all, all, always that potential that pathogens could be brought in on infected seed or removed to a soil. And if that were to happen, they could potentially become established in this area. So the first disease I want to mention is rhizoctonia. And there's several different types of symptoms uh, that you can see with this particular pathogen. You can have just general damping off of the seeds. So generally what happens is you, you get infection, invasion of the seeds. You get pre-emergence damping off. You can also have post-emergence damping off. And usually this is preceded by the symptom uh, that we refer to as wire stem. So basically you get this constriction of the stem. Uh, the plants will generally lodge and uh, eventually die. And I'll show you a photo of what that looks like here in a second. And you can also have general rotting uh, of, the root, of the roots, which will stunt the plants and decrease your yield. So here's kind of a, a list of all the different rhizoctonia groups that we have uh, in some of the dry land areas of the Pacific Northwest. It's kind of a long list here. But what I want you to focus on is this one I have highlighted here, the rhizoctonia solani AG2-1. This is what we refer to as a brassica or a canola pathogen, and it's what's responsible for most of that damping off that we see in canola. So a couple of speakers today have talked about some of the things that are responsible for uh, stand failures or, or reductions in, in emergence, uh, such as the, you know, the high uh, fall heat or uh, the frost. So this was a, a picture of a, a plot in land. This was some winter canola. And you can see parts of this field. You can see the rows pretty plainly. Other areas, it's pretty sparse. And you look in these rows, and you can see the row there in the center. On the left-hand side of this photo, up through the center of the photo, you can see all these little dead carcasses of canola. To the right, there's a couple of plants that are probably on their way out. And this is due to the post-emergence damping off. And this is an example in the greenhouse. Uh, you, can, you can see at the base there the browning and constriction in that, that uh, stem. That's the wire stem symptom I was referring to. This almost always results in the plants lodging and eventually dying. And this is another example you can see on the upper portion of this plant. This plant was pulled out of a field uh, that's a little bit more mature plant. But you can see again this blackening and the browning and constrictions at, at the, the, the base of this plant. So this is right at the soil line, again due to the Rhizoctonia solani AG2-1. And these plants actually had damped off in that field. Another group I want to mention is a little bit less common, but are the binucleate Rhizoctonias. We also refer the, to these as Ceratobacidium. And these can also cause fairly substantial stunting. So this was a greenhouse assay, where on the left we had a control. On the right, we had a couple of different isolates of the ceratobacidium. And you can see, or the, the binucleate rhizoctonia. And you can see that there's a lot of stunting going on in these plants. If you look closely, you can also see some purpling and discoloration of the, the stems of these plants, which is an indication that there's, these plants are, are uh, seeing some nutrient uh, stresses or deficiencies. So management options are pretty limited uh, for this pathogen at this time, although it's, it's quite widespread, and uh, we found it throughout all of the Northwest. Uh, crop rotation generally is not beneficial. Uh, the AG2-1 really likes canola a lot, 
So if you grow something other than canola, the populations will decline, but it's a really good saprophyte. And so that means that the canola, even though the, there's not a canola crop there, AG2-1 can survive on the residue, and it can survive kind of weakly on some of the other host crops. So I have listed here that 2-1 uh, can survive on wheat or barley, although it's a pretty minor pathogen of those crops. Seed treatments are somewhat beneficial for the seedling damping off, so they do protect the seed from the seed rot. However, beyond that phase, the post-emergence damping off, the wire stem symptoms we see, and the subsequent root rotting, really not a lot of protection from, uh, from uh, seed treatments. Probably our best solution for the future is going to be uh, looking at some sort of a resistance, and I know that's something that Dr. Scott Halbert has been working on at WSU along with some of his graduate students. So we may see something coming down the road in that area. So the next disease I want to mention is sclerotinia white mold. Uh, this is a little bit less common than the Rhizoctonia uh, here in the northwest. This particular uh, organism, it's another fungus. It infects from sclerotia in the field by spores that are ejected from apothecia. A lot of big words there. What does this mean? Basically, this, this little structure on the bottom here, little black structure next to that paper clip there, is what's referred to as a sclerotia. It's a little hard, dense mass of fungi. From that, you get these little cup-shaped structures. It's kind of equivalent to a mushroom that you might see in the forest. But these little cup structures will eject uh, spores from them that will appear as little clouds of smoke. These are actually this white clouds of smoke in the second photo here are actually the spores being ejected, and they can easily be blown around by the wind. So the spores then colonize uh, senescing blossoms or other dead plant material, and they, they really prefer uh, the blossoms because that's pretty prevalent or pretty common. Uh, as far as an organic uh, material in the summer, a dead organic material. And they also need wet human conditions. So in a lot of the dry areas, you're not really going to see this pathogen. It's mainly going to be under the high rainfall or irrigated areas. So often what you'll see is the infection beginning at the leaf axle. And the reason for this is oftentimes those senescing blossoms will fall off the plants, and that's where they'll settle, is in those little leaf axles. The fungus must colonize some sort of a senescing uh, plant tissue, dead plant tissue, before it's able to get enough energy to uh, directly invade and colonize the plant and cause disease. But once it does get into the plant, you'll often see water soaking followed by this white bleaching appearance to the stems. And this can progress up and down the stems, but you see on each of these stems here that where you have uh, the infection occurring, it's always near a leaf axle. So in most cases, that's where you see your initial infection. As the season progresses, these stems will actually become somewhat brittle. A lot of times these plants will lodge. And you can see on the photo on the left there, there's actually at the base of that stem, you can see some little black areas. Those are actually new sclerotia that are emerging from the stems that are breaking open. Those will fall into the soil and will serve as an inoculum source for the next year. One of the problems with this disease is that the sclerotia look an awful lot like a canola seed. In this picture here, you can see that there's about five little sclerotia that have gotten mixed in with seed here. So this is something that can occur. You can actually have sclerotia contaminating a seed lot. So management strategies. You want to start with clean seed. You don't want to have them infested with sclerotia. Uh, you can also use fungicide sprays if this is a, a, a serious problem. But this must be properly timed. And it's most effective when it's done at the flowering time because, again, this fungus needs those senescing tissues, the dying uh, blossoms, in order to colonize and get enough energy to cause infection. So you want to do your sprays about that time, but it's, a lot of this has been based on forecasting. Although there's never been a really good correlation between uh, high levels of sclerotia and disease, so it, it's kind of a moving target. If you're using irrigation, you may also want to consider restricting irrigation to some extent at the time of flowering again to uh, remove these uh, beneficial conditions for the fungus because they like that humid, uh, wet conditions. Crop rotation can be effective, but generally you need at least a four-year break away from a susceptible host. So canola is not the only host in this case. There's been over 400 species of broadleaf that have been described as hosts for sclerotinia, and these include a lot of things you might be growing in some of the irrigated areas like potatoes, alfalfa, peas. These are all hosts for sclerotinia. So you need to grow something other than that. And this includes things such as cereals and grasses. Sclerotinia will not invade these crops. So the last disease I want to mention here, and this is probably one of the most important, but at the current time, not something that we have here. Uh, this is probably the most important disease in the Canadian prairies and the Midwest. It can actually result in complete uh, crop failures. 
uh, but it's not found in, in most of the Northwest. Idaho and Washington are, were basically considered to be free of black leg. However, in 2011, there was a field in the Bonners Ferry area up in Boundary County, Idaho, uh, where black leg was found. We got some additional samples from that same area this last summer, and we're still waiting on confirmation as to whether they're black leg or not. But we may potentially ha have this disease uh, starting up here, and it's not something we want to have established. This is a seed-borne disease, and once it becomes established in an area, it can be easily spread by splashing or wind dispersal of spores, and it can survive very well in crop residue. It can survive for years in crop residue and infect subsequent crops. So it's caused by another fungus. In this case, Leptospheria maculans is the name of the fungus. The disease, as I mentioned earlier, is also referred to as foma stem canker. So what does this look like? Uh, and where does it attack? Basically, it can attack any part of the plant above the ground. So on the left here, you can see some cotyledons that are infected, a leaf in the center. On the top right, there's a stem that's become infected. Uh, if symptoms become very severe and the, the fungus moves systemically in the plant, it can actually cause cankers at the base of the plant, followed by lodging. On the bottom left, you can actually see some, this is a cross section of a stem. You can actually see blackening in there. That's actual disease that's moved into the stem from the leaves and getting into the vascular system of that plant and will eventually lead to the stem cankers and, and lodging. On the bottom right is a field that's severely infected and you can see lodging in the plants. You also get premature ripening and you can also get pod infection. So this can also be a seed borne infection which is where the problem really comes in with this. So another picture there showing the, the symptoms on the leaves. These lesions are usually kind of a white to grayish color. They can be round to irregular, irregular in shape. But you also notice these little black pinpoints in there. These little black specks are pycnidia. So it's basically a, a spore producing structure that the fungus has. And it's fairly characteristic of these disease, seeing these little speck, black specks and these lesions on the leaves. As I mentioned, as the disease progresses, if, it, if, if, if infection occurs early enough in the season, you can get systemic infections. It can move down to the lower stem of the plant, and on the case of this plant on the right, you're looking at the crown there. It's cracked and breaking off at the, at the ground. But if you look closely, and it may not show up in this photo, but there's, again, little black specks on that canker that's showing up at the base of that plant. So fairly characteristic of this particular uh, disease. And then uh, at the end of the season, this is a photo of, of some uh, decaying, decaying uh, canola residue in a field. And those structures on there are another fungal structure called the pseudothecia. It's another type of spore structure, but it's one that will allow this fungus to overwinter and survive in residue for years. So it can release spores in the spring that will in then infect the next crop. So right now we're still kind of in the mode of prevention. This is something we don't have widespread and something we don't want to be getting widespread. So you need to be sure you're starting with disease-free certified seed. You don't want to be getting seed, common seed from the, a, a neighbor down the road. And you also want to use some sort of a fungicide seed treatment. Uh, I mentioned this as a seed-borne pathogen, and it usually infects the seed at a very low rate. Usually less than 1% of seed, even in a highly uh, infected field, will become infected. So a fairly low rate. However, even a 1% infection or even a 0.1% infection, when you can start considering on a, a field basis how many plants that is per acre, that can be a sub fairly substantial amount of, uh, of pathogen. So the fungicide seed treatment can uh, be beneficial in killing the fungus that's on the seed, the mycelium. If it does become established or in areas where it is established, growers need to rely on a three-year break between canola or other brassica crops. Uh, this is one pathogen that is specific for canola but, or other brassicas, but will also go to wild mustards. So you need to be sure to control volunteers and, and weeds. There is some resistance, uh, however, it's been known uh, to break down, so similar to the, the rust that a lot of us face in the cereals, uh, resistance can break down uh, to black leg. So there's no real great solution to this disease, but there are some tools. Uh, you can also bury residue, and uh, this will accelerate the, the decomposition of the, of the fungus in the soil. It'll also prevent release of the spores in the spring, so even though there may be spores there, they can't be released to, to cause infection to neighboring plants. Protective fungicide sprays have also been used, but this can become costly. So with that, I'll just uh, end with a, a few guidelines here. There's some pretty great resources. The Pacific Northwest 
uh, Plant Disease Management Handbook, uh, the Compendium of Brassica Diseases, this is put out by APS Press, and also the uh, Canola, Canola, Canola Council of Canada has a great resource, kind of a, kind of a farmer's uh, management handbook for canola production. So some great resources for learning more about the diseases I've talked about today or, or other diseases you might be interested in learning about with canola. Thanks.